Hello everyone. My name is Indruj. I'm a partner with Direct Tax Practice of Ketan and Company. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience in India and around the world. We hope each and every one of you is healthy, safe, and fine. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. This webinar is a joint initiative between Ketan and Company's corporate practice and KPMG India's m and Tax and Deal Advisory Practice. The webinar is titled How to Do Price Adjustments in Earnout in Indian m and Transactions, Legal Tax and Accounting Considerations. Next slide, please. Thank you. The webinar is timely and topical because adopting purchase price adjustments and earnout structure can be the difference between doing a deal or not. Due to the impact of COVID on global m and market, the buyers are apprehensive in closing transactions and are seriously concerned about business valuations. The impact of COVID on near to long-term business earnings and asset values is unknown. Hence, adopting purchase price adjustments and earnout structure can be that very useful tool in closing deals. They can help in addressing valuation concerns and future business performances. In this webinar, we will take you through purchase price adjustments and earnout structures in Indian M&A context. We will talk about the concept in each structure, and we will also talk about structuring the transactions. We will then take you through some regulatory issues that are faced while structuring such transactions in, in the context of cross-border M&A. We will also talk about key drafting issues to be kept in mind so that potential disputes at the time of implementation can be avoided. Next slide, please. Next slide. Our first speaker is Prasanjit Chakravarti. Prasanjit is a partner in the corporate and MA practice group at Ketan and Company. Prasanjit is a very experienced corporate lawyer with extensive experience in domestic and inbound MA. He regularly advises domestic and international corporate clients on a wide array of transactions, including MA, management buyouts, foreign investments, joint ventures, and strategic alliances. Prasanjit also regularly advises European clients and is a part of firm's German desk. Prasanjit will be explaining the use of purchase price adjustments and are not in the Indian MA context and also touch upon drafting issues. Next slide, please. Our next speaker is Nitish Podar. Nitish is a partner in KPMG India's deal advisory practice. He's the national leader for private equity in KPMG India. Our third speaker is Rajendra Nalam. Rajendra is a partner in KPMG India's MA tax practice and has over 19 years of experience specializing in transactional structuring. He also heads the Indo-Japan m and tax practice for KPMG India. Nitish and Raj will be explaining the tax and accounting issues to be kept in mind for purchase price adjustments and earnouts in Indian m and The format for today's webinar will be in form of a formal presentation followed by a Q&A session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation or towards the end in the Q&A session. To ask a question, simply use the facility provided in the webinar portal. We will try and take as many questions as time permits. Any balanced questions we will try and address offline. You will also receive a copy of today's presentation and a link to the recording of the webinar. Now, without further delay, I'll request Prasanjit to begin with this presentation. Over to you, Prasanjit. Uh, thank you very much, Intruj, <clears throat> and a very warm uh, morning and afternoon to people in Asia and Asia, and also a very, very warm morning to people joining from Europe. Uh, so the, I think the first question really about uh, purchase price adjustment is uh, why do we need purchase price adjustment and what is really purchase price adjustment? So uh, simplistically put, uh, invariably in most m &A transactions, there will be a time lag by the time a reference balance sheet is drawn up, this is which the uh, valuation between the parties are arrived at. And by the time uh, the execution of the transaction document happens, and by the time closing happens, there is a substantial time lag. Now that time lag can be on account of uh, several factors, including uh, it's resolving issues for which have emanated pursuant to due diligence. There could be a regulatory approval, which may be required, uh, so on and so forth. Now what happens is, you know, between the signing of the transaction document and closing, uh, the buyer is always apprehensive that, look, what if the health and position of the company has altered for the worse? To illustrate, let's say when the agreement is signed, the inventory count is worth, uh, let's say, 
$100,000. However, by the time the closing happens, the inventory count is reduced to half of it. So ideally, the buyer would not like to pay the full value for the company would like to adjust the purchase price downwards to factor this reduction of the inventory value. Uh, this is precisely the reason uh, purchase price adjustment is required. It's it's really helps in uh, kind of uh, uh, allocating the risks equally between the buyer and the seller. The illustration I just gave it could also be reversed. For example, the inventory count from 100,000 doubles to $200,000. Then the seller on the contrary will expect that it is paid uh, and it's due for the incremental benefit uh, which the company will really deny because of the additional inventory. So a purchase price adjustment is a win-win for both parties in this situation where the adjustment really factors in any upside or downward movement uh, in several matrices. Now, one additional point to be noted for buyers is that, look, you will always have warranties, representations, and indemnities in a shared purchase agreement. Then why do you need separately and in the purchase price adjustment mechanics? Uh, the reason for that is, look, there are some process uh, to be followed when you invoke an indemnity claim, and that often can be time consuming. And therefore, to avoid that, you can have a much more easier and, and seamless way by having a completion accounts process in which there is no arbitrator who is involved, but merely an accountant who adjudicates any disputes which may arise and parties can mutually arrive at this adjustment process. So moving on, uh, question is how do we structure purchase price adjustments? Naturally, you know, there can be financial uh, metrics which can be used. You can on your screen see some of the metrics, but let me tell you that the most common used metrics is the working capital adjustment, uh, which is the net working capital. Now that really is critical because uh, if there is a fluctuation in the working capital from the signing date to the closing date, uh, the buyer ought to know what is the fluctuation uh, because the buyer will be seriously apprehensive to inject and infuse capital after it completes the transaction. So that's one more reason why the buyer should really have a robust completion accounts mechanism in place. Uh, the, uh, what is also critical is that, you know, if there is any non-financial metric, for example, there are, you know, there's a delay in closing or there is a material adverse effect. So the buyer, instead of staging a walkout from the transaction, it may really look to reduce the purchase price uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, balance the situation now. Uh, moving on, uh, I think the biggest hurdle when it comes to a uh, purchase price adjustment which involves a non-resident buyer is the regulatory framework which India has. Very simply put, uh, if a buyer wants to, let's say, uh, has to pay a purchase price of $100, can it hold back or defer $50 out of that? The answer is no, because the regulatory framework enshrines that you can only hold back up to 25% of the aggregate purchase price. And the time frame for the holdback and deferment is only 18 months from the execution of the share purchase agreement or the definitive agreement. So those are two critical, critical timelines and thresholds to be borne in mind when structuring earnouts. Uh, the earnout also has to be at all times complied with pricing norms. So let's say uh, if the fair market value or the purchase price uh, is around $50 and, and I'm only going to pay as the non-resident buyer $25, that will unfortunately not work and you will have to seek prior approval. So therefore, it's critical to keep the fair pricing valuation norms back of your mind when you structure earnouts. The next factor is also when we deal with Indian unlisted public companies, uh, very often people ignore the fact that there are some securities laws which are also applicable to unlisted public companies. And one such law is the Securities Contract Regulation Act, the SCRA. And it's absolutely vitally important that you keep that in mind because that regulation requires the transaction to be closed on the same day or the next day of the date of the uh, agreement and transfer of shares. So uh, you have to keep all of this in mind when you structure the transaction. The good news is there are several ways and means to structure uh, working capital adjustment and purchase price adjustments. 
I will come to that a bit later uh, during this presentation. Last but not the least is how do you get around drafting uh, completion accounts clause and what are the key areas to watch out for? I think the first and foremost thing I would, I would say is please have specificity in mind. Define which thresholds are being considered, what are relevant thresholds, for example, uh, if debt was never factored in, in your transaction while valuing the transaction, that's not an important metric. But if you have working capital adjustment in place, then working capital should have been an underlying assumption, which is critical. And make sure there's no overlap between cash and working capital and similar concepts, and you define with as much precision as you can. Uh, second is timelines, because ultimately the process, simplistically put, is that after the completion happens, the buyer's accountant will drop the accounts, send it to the seller accountants for verification. And if both parties agree, then it's all fine. But if they don't agree, then the dispute is escalated to an accountant and not an arbitrator. Because if it goes to an arbitrator, it assumes a legal dispute and it's again long drawn. If it's the whole purpose of completion account adjustment. So, so you then refer it to an accountant who then resolves the matter and the accountant's remit has to be watertight and narrow. It cannot be anything and everything under the sun. It can reopen. It has to be absolutely confined to the formula which has been set out and enshrined in the share purchase agreement. And accordingly, the accountant should proceed to just and confine itself to the limited aspect which the parties want. The whole process has to be time bound. There should not be an elastic period of time which goes on for years. That's not the intent of the parties. Uh, there should be the method of payment which should be clearly enunciated in the document. So <clears throat> within seven days or 10 days, whatever is the timeline. And more importantly, uh, there should be a cap on the payment. The buyer does not want to overpay and shoot its budget of the transaction. There should be a cap beyond which the buyer should not be required to be paid. Uh, so that's really uh, in gist of what drafting and legal issues and contractual issues of uh, uh, this transaction is, the work capital account. Thanks, Prasanjit. That was very helpful insight into purchase price adjustments, regulatory and drafting concerns. I had a question here. We usually see buyers adopt reps and warranties and indemnity in documents. Do you think that can be a substitute for purchase price adjustment? Well, I mean, uh, I think thanks for that. I think superficially the answer looks yes that you can, but actually I would advise a buyer that warranties and indemnities are not a substitute uh, for for uh, working capital adjustment or purchase price adjustment. As I alluded to earlier, for a simple reason, the uh, indemnity claim has a process which has to be followed. You have to give a claims notice to the seller that can be disputed if it's disputed. It then it goes to the arbitration, which we all know can take its own time. Uh, in contrast, uh, purchase price adjustment has a much more simpler regime, which I just explained. All you need to do as a buyer's accountant is to drop the draft accounts, uh, send it across to the seller's accountant. Within the pre-agreed parameters, which I mentioned should be clearly defined, there is hardly any scope and room for dispute if the wording is watertight. If at all there is a dispute in computation, the accountant has a very limited remit. Uh, therefore, everything gets resolved in a very quick span of time. So I think completion account adjustment stands on the independent footing. And regardless of robust warranties and indemnities, which one must have, uh, I would still strongly advise a buyer to have a completion uh, adjustment process. Well, thank you. That was very well explained. Uh, thanks for that. Nitish and Raj, would you like to now take us through the accounting and tax considerations to be kept in mind while structuring purchase price adjustments? Thanks, thanks very much, Indruj, and uh, thanks a lot, Prasenjit, for your comments. So I will, uh, and hello everyone. Uh, so I will, what I'll do is I will take you through the slides. I will take you through the first four slides and then hand over to my colleague Raj to talk you through the last two slides on tax. Uh, so the first slide that I wanted to talk to you about was findings from a financial and tax due diligence perspective and how that should be appropriately reflected in the transaction documents, right? Unouts are always complicated, right? Because there is a larger, longer time period involved, right? And findings from financial and tax due diligence, what happens more often than not is that some of the findings may not look very critical at the first glance, right? But if you're looking at an earnout structure, when there are uh, there is a period of 12 months, 18 months, six months involved, and it's a longer time period that is involved, right? 
you should be able to uh, you should be able to uh, you should be able to appropriately factor all the findings from financial and tax due diligence in your transaction documents i'll give you a few examples right a simple thing like not having a signed customer contract may look very simple right you would not think about putting it that in the transaction document because it may not be critical from that transaction perspective right but in an unknown situation tomorrow let's say if the customer goes away once you have taken over the business right it can lead to a dispute wherein you can wherein the other party could say that that customer has gone gone away simply because the new uh the new management has come in the new promoters have come in the new man and and therefore there were some issues with that right so to be able to tackle all those issues all specific reps warranties condition precedents and specifically condition subsequent which are the findings from the financial and tax due diligence should be appropriately factored in the transaction documents you can ask your accounting and tax advisors to give you a long list and we do that very often in most of our transactions of all the things that needs to be factored in such that the earn out and ultimate transition becomes smooth so that's the first tile the second tile is accounting standards now india you know as some of you may know you know the accounting standards in india is very complicated we used to follow the historical method of accounting which was the indian gap then we are now transitioning to something called indas for all of you those who don't know indas is pretty much similar to ifrs with some changes uh, specifically put in from an indian context but for all practical purposes it pretty much mirrors ifrs right now in india the companies are transitioning from indian gap to indas in a phased manner right some of the large cap companies the listed companies etc were the first to transition then there were then there were certain threshold requirements in terms of revenue and share capital those transition and ultimately over the next one year i think all the company will companies will transition right one thing very important if you are looking at an earnout structure today in india right you need to have two sets of accounts which follow the same accounting standards and are comparable i e if during diligence you have looked at indian gap financials basis which you have come to a transaction document right the closing accounts or the earn out accounts should also be prepared as per indian gap to make it comparable there is a significant difference between indian gap which is based on historical costing and indas which is based on fair value right so to be able to make it comparable either you make the historical accounts to indas and then you move to indas or if the historical accounts were at indian gap then the closing accounts has to be based on indian gap as well such that it is comparable so that is very very critical a lot of times we we tend to overlook these finer points the third point is form of accounts and line items should be defined right and in this i will take three specific categories one is ebitda the second is working capital and the third is net debt you know these are the three most critical items when it comes to earn out determination or closing a transaction and you know there can be a lot of dispute because ebitda is not defined anywhere neither is working capital defined anywhere nor is net debt defined anywhere these are just concepts right so to be able to ensure that there's no dispute at a later date right please have enclosures or annexures to your transaction documents which define the line items in relation to ebitda working capital and net debt and to the extent possible the closing accounts should mirror those line items there will always be a situation where there could be a new line item that may come up where there could be a new uh, situation that may come up because of which some of the line items may need to be changed yes there could be a situation there but given what we know today right it is always advisable to have an annexure to your transaction documents which defines line by line as to what would ebitda include and not include what would working capital include and not include and what would net debt include and not include that's the third thing the fourth point that i want to uh, mention is it's a new concept in india but it's uh, it's becoming very common very fast right which is the transition services arrangement now in an out out which is a 12 month period right uh, the the seller would also want a say in the business because at the end of the day he is also uh, or the performance of the company he wants a 
pie in the performance of the company because his payout ultimately is also responsible as to how the company performs right when the closing happens or the earnout structures uh, kick in right so more often than not a transition services arrangement is agreed from the period when the first closing or signing happens and the first tranche payouts happen till that time the final earnout structure happens and maybe a three to six month period after that there's a transition services arrangement for common services for common functions for certain critical functions which the seller would want to sort of control for a certain period himself so a watertight transition services arrangement in addition to your transaction document this is a separate additional document needs to be agreed to because once you have a transition service arrangement where every roles and responsibilities is appropriately laid out this will lead to a smoother earnout closure and closing of the transaction and minimize complexities and give you if you are the buyer of the business a very early exit from the dep from dependence on seller and facilitate lesser complexity and lesser ambiguity right so these are the four tiles from an accounting perspective for the next two tiles from a tax perspective i would want to hand over to my colleague raj raj thanks nitesh coming to the tax issues um we have two tiles here on tile number five first we speak about shorter term issues that may happen and these are uh matters that are captured before uh the closing is done which means that these are adjustments that will go to change the deal consideration and therefore these have a finite life for example a refund uh, from a tax department that has just been received or a demand that has just been raised these were developments that were not clear to us at the time when the agreement was signed however at the time of closing these uh, some events like this have happened and so the contract will have a clear provision to say where there is an additional leakage from the company or there is a refund which actually increases the value of the company these will go into the working capital adjustments and therefore to that extent they will increase or reduce the price so these are the shorter term issues that we speak about however as we all know tax litigations can take a lot of time so we may often end up in a situation where we don't quite know when and to what extent a certain resolution, a certain um, controversy or a litigation may actually get resolved. So in that case, we may have a longer term arrangement to look at adjusting for such a development. So for example, let's say that there is a massive income tax litigation going on and the seller is dead sure that this is a refund that will come to the company and therefore the value of the company is higher. Understandably, a buyer might take a far more cautious approach and say that, look, I'm not willing to take this risk. As far as I'm concerned, this is a development that's way too uncertain for us to plan something right now. So as a middle path to this, the parties may come up with various structures. For example, a separate escrow arrangement, which simply means that whatever is the value of this adjustment as agreed between the parties is simply held back and put into an escrow account. So if the seller is correct and he wins the case and company gets that refund, then the money simply gets released in favor of the seller. And conversely, if the matter is lost and the buyer was right, this is an amount that does not get paid over to the seller. It is also possible that such a pricing adjustment is effected through other means or other structures. And those may be required, for example, like Prasenjit was mentioning earlier, um, it is more than 25% of the deal consideration. It is longer than 18 months, and there is a non-resident party involved. So in such a case, these could be significantly large items having a major bearing on the transaction itself and the value of the transaction. Therefore, we might put in place an entirely different structure to adjust such a pricing mechanism. We will probably speak about some of these when we get to the earnout uh, part of this discussion today. But suffice it to say. Uh, tax liabilities could cause significant movements in the deal uh, consideration and therefore warrant special attention and simple structures that can actually uh, look out and ensure that there are no disputes between the parties. So that concludes tile six as well.
Thank you, Nitish and Raj. I mean, you raised very important issues and offered really good practical guidance. Um, Nitish, if I could just quickly ask a question over here. So there's an increased trend in UK, UK and European markets to adopt lockbox approach. Uh, just wanted to know what your thoughts were, if these could be implemented in Indian context and in what you've seen so far. Sure, thanks, Indraj. So I think, look, uh, you know, one of the clear advantages of adopting a locked box mechanism is the speed of the transaction, right? If you adopt a locked box mechanism effectively as on the date of signing, you are agreeing to an equity value and you're saying there is no closing adjustments that will happen. And therefore, once all CPs, etc., are done, which may be a period of 15 days, 30 days, 45 days, or 60 days, you can quickly close the transaction, right? So there's no necessity of doing another round of diligence or anything of that sort, right? So whilst this is the advantage, you know, there are quite a few disadvantages in terms of, uh, uh, you know, using locked box, and specifically in the Indian scenario. This has historically been used in stable, mature markets, right? Um, in India, you know, there are two or three things we need to keep in mind when we think about using locked box. Once, one locked box cannot be used in seasonal businesses, right? So, so let's say a winter wear company where the sales are typically in 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 the uh, winter months and uh, there is only inventory pile up in the summer months, uh, or any of these kind of seasonal businesses, right? You can't use the lock box because you can't project the working capital stroke the net debt of those businesses, right? In a very high growth business, right? So a company which is growing at a 10% monthly kegel or 5% monthly kegel for that matter. You never know how the working capital and the net debt is going to pan out. You never know how the EBITDA, et cetera, is going to pan out, right? So it is never advisable to be able to use to be to be to use lockbox in those situations. The other thing which is very important from an Indian context is that if there is predictability of the business for a short period of time from the time we are signing the transaction right and the accounting systems and processes of the company where we are planning to apply the lockbox is mature and stable then i don't think there is a problem in using lockbox in any other situation the uncertainties in the indian market is significant because of which there have been fewer lockbox situations but obviously uh, over the last three or four years, there have been many more situations where lockbox uh, has been sort of used as a mechanics to closing, but there are but lockbox cannot be generically applied in all transactions. We have to be very careful, uh, given the conditions that I've just detailed out. If those conditions are pretty much met, we can do a lockbox. It definitely helps in speedier closing of the transaction, but we have to be very careful because as a buyer, we don't want to be caught in the wrong side if we used a locked box and then at the closing, we realize that we are getting much lower working capital or much higher debt. Thank you, Nitish. I mean, thanks for sharing the pros and cons and uh, explaining that so well. We can maybe now move on to earn out structures. I would request Prasunji to first take us through the legal issues and the drafting issues also touching upon regulatory bits. And Nitish and Raj can then take us through the tax considerations and accounting considerations. Over to you, Prasenjit, for now. Thank you. Thanks, Indruj. And, and thanks, uh, Nitish, and thanks, Raj. Uh, well, really, again, begin talking about uh, what is earnout and how is it really different from purchase price adjustment? I think just to uh, make it very clear, uh, while purchase price adjustment, we, which we just spoke at length uh, you know, in the previous slides, deals with the performance of the company until closing. In contrast, uh, earnouts really is about a construct which talks about the future performance of the company and bases the future performance of the company, the what kind of rewards uh, and risk are apportioned between the parties. To give a simple example, uh, in this current climate where future, uh, business future prospects are very, very uncertain and wobbly, uh, seller will always be optimistic with its business you know they always are optimistic a buyer is in contrast always cautiously optimistic they will not be overly optimistic and therefore to give an example uh, let's say a seller today values its business at uh, let's say 10 million dollars uh, in contrast uh, given some factors due to business uncertainty etc etc the buyer values the business at 2 million dollars so there is a massive gap uh, and the valuation mismatch between the seller and the buyer. So what option do the parties have? Either to drop the deal altogether, which is really not helpful for them, uh, or what they do is take the 2 million as the purchase price, 
and try and pay the residual purchase price of 8 million depending on the performance of the company over a period of next three to four years. Now, that's just a very simplistic example. There are several nuances, but just to explain that this is how earnout is supposed to work. The principal objective being to bridge the valuation gap and allow the buyer to also arrange for additional capital, uh, especially and de-risk itself from, let's say, an uncertain future or performance of the target company. Now, what are the real advantages of earnout, which I just mentioned some of them, that it mitigates any overvaluation, if a buyer is facing some liquidity crunch, especially in today's day and age when raising finance may not be that straightforward and easy uh, given the, the current crunch, uh, maybe it can buy some time by paying part of the consideration upfront and deferring it and structuring it as an earn out, the residual part. From the seller standpoint equally, uh, if the company does well, it stands to really gain substantially uh, and partake in the upside. So it's a win-win for both, both parties, but it has to be structured very well and drafted very, very well. Uh, thirdly, what is the basis of earnouts? Again, like completion accounts, there could be monetary thresholds, there could be non-monetary thresholds. Typically, we have seen monetary thresholds which are being used, whether in terms of revenue, whether it's income, uh, simply because those are easier to arrive and compute as against, let's say, a new line of business being started or X number of customers being introduced, uh, what happens is there is a qualitative aspect there and parties can then get into dispute that whether it satisfies the qualitative aspect or not. In contrast, the revenue threshold is far more easier to demonstrate. And if it's achieved, the earnout uh, can be paid before the earnout maturity period. Uh, moving on, how do you structure earnouts? I think two broad points I wish to make here is uh, what happens if, let's say, uh, the milestones are not met in entirety, but partially? Should the seller not be entitled to benefit of the milestones just because it has not met it entirely? I think it's a while it's a commercial call, but in my view, and which we have often seen actually, it's it's not really a binary thing. It's not all or nothing. It's largely a phased payout. If the seller does meet in a phased manner part of the milestones, then it is entitled to the earnout payout and it is paid accordingly, uh, which it should be in an equitable sense. Secondly, what is the duration of earnout? Should it be one year, two years, five years, ten years? Uh, again, there's no magic bullet or or you know one size will not fit all. Uh, more or less, I think it should be not too long for the simple reason if it's too long, there could be a you know target fatigue where, where the buyer uh, you know can take long term decisions, the seller will lose its path. There could be events like COVID 19 which can have an impact on the business. It's not ideal for the seller to have extremely long, long term of earnout. On the contrary, if it's too short a time, uh, then it may not be able to turn around the business uh, to the expectation of the buyer and may not be able to achieve the earnout and therefore defeat the whole purpose of the earnout. A, sh a short term, too short term uh, a period can also be detrimental to buyer because the seller will take decisions keeping uh, just the earnout in mind, a short term decision, which may not be beneficial for the buyer in the long run. So therefore, ideally what we have seen in practice a two to three years period is what we have seen as a timeline. Uh, structuring it out very quickly on regulatory issues, uh, similar concerns really. You cannot have, let's say you want to hold back, let's say the entire purchase price, the headline purchase price is $100. Uh, you cannot hold back $80. That's not allowed because as I mentioned, uh, under Indian regulatory laws, the maximum you can hold back is 25% of the headline purchase price, which in this example will be $25. Uh, the time period cannot be three years because it's 18 months from the signing of the definitive agreement. So that's another handicap and we have to find alternate ways to structure it. Uh, then uh, in so far as uh, uh, you know, drafting and contractual issues, uh, three, four points really. Firstly, very, very clearly define what is the earnout matrix? What does the seller have to do in order to achieve the earnout? If that is not clear, Invariably, the parties will get into a dispute and that really will throw everything into out of gear. So very critical to really define, is it a particular revenue which is expected to be achieved? 
and what all steps can the seller take now let's take an example that a seller has completely exited from the company and it has no control uh, over the company it is merely acting as a key managerial employee and the buyer is taking decisions which is completely uh, going to defeat the whole earn out mechanism for example the buyer decides to set up a new line of business or decides to merge his business now what happens then so all this needs to be factored in by the seller when uh, they draft the earn out provision so that the seller a reserves enough rights in the contract so that the buyer cannot act in a whimsical fashion to defeat the earn out's whole uh, principle here secondly the there should be certain events which should accelerate a payout for example the buyer decides to consolidate the group uh, it can be very difficult for the seller to then demonstrate that it has achieved on its own the earned out matrices so that should be a uh, you know uh, ground for accelerating the payment similarly if the buyer decides to transfer its business to a third party that again seller may not have quite the same trust which it has reposed in this buyer the existing buyer that they will cooperate and pay the earn out so that should trigger a ground to accelerate the earn out payment so all this one has to factor in when you know kind of uh, structuring and earn out otherwise it will go in a dispute uh, and and it will not really help the cause uh, but definitely the seller should have rights uh, to, in order to uh, have enough checks and balances so that the buyer does not act to the detriment of the seller's interest equally buyer should not give the sellers a free run so that the sellers take only a myopic approach a short term approach and in the long run the company's interest will be hurt and jeopardized uh, that should not be the case as well very clearly it has to be a balanced approach so that both parties come out of the negotiation room uh, having a win win feeling uh, in their in their minds uh, with this i will request uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, kpmg to really take this through the tax issues with our now sure sure thanks prasenjit so to speak about uh, some of the structures on how you actually achieve uh and earn out over a protracted period of time uh some of which might actually be longer than uh what is expressly permitted for certain kind of structures under fema the taxability of those earn outs really depends on which kind of structure that you follow uh to summarize broadly there could be three kinds of structures one is a structure that is based on capital account which means that this is like a joint venture the seller continues with some role in the company and therefore he continues to hold on to a certain amount of stock now that stock could be either preference shares it could be equity or it could be something else and the taxability of that will be calculated in one way that could be capital gains it could also be tax paid as a buyback tax by the uh, target company itself those will vary and the tax rates are also quite different on the other hand where the uh, seller is continuing in the capacity of a professional then he has no equity stake in the company but he is consulting with the target let's say for a period of 12 months subsequent to the acquisition in that case you would have what is like a business payment and that would be income that is earned and taxable as regular income for the seller the third is that he actually continues as a employee of the target for 1 to 3 years or whatever is the agreed time he's helping with transition he's helping with growth he's helping with a bunch of other things there he could be paid as a combination of salary plus an accelerated bonus which compensates him for the results that he's actually able to deliver for the target and therefore for the buyer now in that case the income will get taxed as salary and that is likely to get taxed at the highest rate um without any major deductions or reduction so each of these structures will lead to a different tax outcome and will is something that will be keenly watched by the seller on the other hand the buyer and the target will also be conscious that if the payment is happening in the way of a um capital account that is not something which offers a tax break for the for the target company seller would naturally like that uh, a certain amount of tax break is also available if so uh, something like a 
consulting payment or a salary payment or a bonus payment would be helpful. Um, so the tax cost on this um, is therefore to be decided who allocates, who bears which part of the tax incidence. So it is possible, we've seen all kinds of models. In some cases, it is split between the parties and one also factors into account the impact of the tax break. In some cases, it is entirely to the account of the seller. The buyer takes a position that, look, I'm paying you X amount of total earner. How you pay tax on it, what tax occurs, is the incidence on it is entirely your concern, not ours. And of course, there are cases where it's like a net of tax payment where the buyer himself takes on the entire onus. Now, moving on to the second aspect of it, which is the timing of tax. And this um, ties into the whole argument around whether an earnout payment is simply a deferred payment or is it a contingent payment? And the difference between the two is if it is a deferred payment, then the seller knows that he's going to get this income. It's just a matter of waiting for, say, six months or 12 months. In that case, there is no ambiguity around taxation and therefore tax will apply upfront on day one itself. On the other hand, where the tax itself is, uh, where the payment is actually contingent on the occurrence of certain events, meaning that tax may apply or may not apply, in that case, there is a good case to argue that tax will be paid only if the amount comes. In turn, this also impacts tax withholding obligations for the buyer uh, and the tax impact for the seller actually coincides with the time when he actually has money. Some other tax areas around applicability of GST rules, depending on the nature of one out arrangement. So we should think about have a more broad canvas around what taxes apply to a certain arrangement. If it's salary, no, but if it's like a consulting arrangement, yes, GST will apply. Also applicability of transfer pricing provisions on the overall reasonability of the payout structure that is there. So for example, if we agree to a salary or a bonus payout and the amount paid is just um, completely out of sync with the reasonability of the payment, now whether that should be deductible, is it a transfer pricing controversy or all issues that need to be seen. So that brings to a conclusion uh, this slide. Thanks, Raj. Uh, now I'll talk. I'll just briefly uh, spend two minutes on the accounting and tax uh, things that you should be very careful about uh, when you are structuring earnouts. Right. <clears throat> the first and the foremost thing is that the performance metric for the earnout should be very straightforward, with as low chances of manipulation or ambiguity as possible. Right. Uh, and the most easiest way to do is have a revenue defined revenue earnout or an EBITDA earnout, right? So let's take a couple of examples. In one of the situations uh, that I happened to sort of uh, see where I was not involved, luckily, was that the the earnout said that you have to have a minimum of 20% Kager growth in revenue and EBITDA. You need to get at least three new customers, and you have to have a credit period of less than 30 days from each customer for the earnout to kick in, right? Now, I'll tell you what the dispute there was. What that earnout said is you need to get three new customers. Now, the seller got three new customers, but those three new customers actually during that period gave less than 0.1% of the overall revenues of the company. But the buyer said, no, no, that's not what I meant. I wanted you to you know, get three new large customers, right, which provides significant revenue to the business. And that's how the earnout would kick in. He said, that's not defined. You said three new customers. I got three new customers. If they have not given me order again, that's not my problem, right? And it led to a dispute. So therefore, it's always, always advisable to use revenue and EBITDA because those are definable, number one. Number two, you can, you can, you should also not give a very broad range, right? So you can say, okay, the revenue target for earnout to be achieved is let's say 1000 crores plus minus 5%, plus minus 2%, whatever you're comfortable with. The EBITDA has to be 20% of the revenue, right? Or the EBITDA has to be at least 220 crores plus minus 5% for the uh, for the uh, earnout to kick in, right? So, you, so I, I'm sure you, you get what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say is make it as definable and for an easy to measure metric. Don't keep vague earnouts 
people in their bid to maybe try and win everything the earnouts are at times made so vague and so complicated that it is bound to lead to disputes so that is number one number two is on accounting policies now this is very very important in my view and i'll give you a classic example that i went through um, in a situation where i was not involved when the when the signing of the transaction was happening but i unfortunately or fortunately got involved at the time when the earn out structuring was happening now what we realized was when we were doing the when the diligence etc was done and the signing etc was done and the first closing etc was done uh, you know the target had a policy of all debtors above 180 days to be fully written off right basis that a reference working capital was identified and they said that at the time of the earn out or closing or whatever happens this is the reference working capital that will be used either a fixed number or as a number of days of revenue by the time that earn out came right the policy had been changed to 365 days as a result what happened was my reference working capital was fixed at 100 let's say because i had 180 days of provision of debtors and in the closing my actual actual working capital went up to 120 right because my provisioning was reduced from 180 days to 365 days and above and therefore the seller came and said that look you need to pay me this additional 20 rupees right so therefore please again as an annexure list down all the critical accounting policies which require judgment provision for inventory provision for doubtful debts retirement benefits there's so many accounting policies that require i'm sure your lawyers can help you with that there's so many uh, things which require judgment please define that don't leave it open or ambiguous because otherwise it is it it will lead to sort of uh, uh, some kind of a confusion or uh, litigation and last and most critical is please include include a right to audit clause it should not so happen that for the earnout to be determined the seller comes and gives you an audited set of financial statement and says that look i have achieved the ebitda now let's say let's let's uh, give me my payout that ebitda from an from an audited set of financial statement you may see that yes the, uh, the 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 ebitda of 220 crores has been achieved but then when you go down and check there could be one off non recurring etc items one extraordinary item for let's say a scrap sale of 35 crores in that particular year which has never happened in the past in the audited financial statement it will come as part of your ebitda but if it is not in the normal course of business that will should not be considered to be able to determine that ebitda so depending on how you have defined your accounting policies how have you defined your performance matrices and the fact that you have a right to audit clause is very very important because a right to audit clause gives you the ability to deep dive and look at whether the 220 crores of ebitda that you are getting is sustainable and is not one off or non recurring or some unusual items are not sitting there so these are the three or four things there are obviously many more things that you can you have to be very careful about but these three four basic things is super critical and at times we have seen that we may sort of overlook these items with that i'll take a pause and hand over back to indruj and prasenjit uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Nitesh and Raj. That was extremely well explained. Uh, I think without uh, taking much time, I think I'm uh, aware of the time on the clock here. So I will just quickly conclude with the key takeaways and then take questions, uh, so that you know we can make it more engaging. Uh, just in terms of takeaways, the first takeaway is really uh, then you know the risk allocation. What does this uh, whole purchase price adjustment and or now does is really allocates the risk equitably between the parties. And in my view, no negotiation is lopsided. Any negotiation where one party walks away with the table feeling overly confident is, is really not a fair negotiation. So it, at the end of the day, it's really, it's in the heart of and core of the four and fair negotiation is that parties allocate the risks equally. And these two tools, purchase price adjustment and earnouts, in my view, does a remarkable job, especially in today's day and age. Uh, secondly, as we all explained that watertight contractual provisions, ironclad contracts are the key in order to implement a concept into a written codified document. If the agreement is loosely worded, then a very good concept can go for a toss and really uh, there could be parties can be embroiled in long-run disputes 
and further deteriorating their relationships uh, forever. Uh, last but not the least, legal tax and accounting advice should be sought. That's pretty much needless to say these are the three critical pillars uh, while drafting such a contract. And uh, all three stakeholders uh, should work integrally in a closely aligned manner to produce a product which really gets the parties over the line uh, with a win-win situation to avoid any ambiguity and minimize any potential disputes. With that, I will uh, thank you all and really pass it on back to Inruj to do the Q&A session. Thank you, Prasanjit. That concludes our presentation for today. I thank our speakers for that very interesting presentation. We will now commence with the Q&A session. This is your opportunity to ask questions with our expert speakers. We do have several questions. We'll try and address as many as possible. Any balanced questions, we'll try and address offline. The first, speaker, the first question we have is, given the regulatory challenges you highlighted previously in terms of deferred consideration, how do you structure an earnout model involving a non-resident buyer? Prasenjit, would you like to take this? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, Andrew. I think uh, that's a very interesting question, and and I wish I had more time uh, at my disposal to explain. But I will be very brief and succinct here, uh, as I try to explain that there are ways and means to structure earnout and purchase price adjustment, uh, despite the regulatory hurdle of 25% limit and 18 months, some of the options very quickly are, uh, for example, the seller can enter into, if it's an individual, can enter into a contractual uh, arrangement with the buyer, uh, or it can enter into a consultancy arrangement into a buyer, get bonus and some other kind of uh, emoluments through which it can receive that, that payment, which is to be paid on a deferred basis. Having said that, uh, there are tax ramifications which should be factored in, uh, and therefore that has to be commercially weighed uh, how much tax is to be paid and should really uh, that be borne equally between the buyer and the seller uh, to make it more even steven. The second option we have seen many a times is really a preference shares model, which are non-voting preference shares. Now, what happens is that the target company issues at a nominal value non-voting preference shares to the seller. So the seller, let's say for an example, pays only 10 rupees at a very nominal price, subscribes to these preference shares, which carries no voting rights. And then uh, if the metrics are met, the thresholds are met, the milestones are met, then the premium, through a premium, these shares are redeemed by the target company. So therefore the promoter or the seller gets through this premium redemption, uh, the earnout amount or the purchase price adjustment amount. In contrast, if the earnout metrics are not met, the thresholds are not met, then these amounts uh, are not paid to the promoter and are redeemed uh, by the company at a nominal value, uh, which is 10 rupees. So that's how these are the few options which are there. Needless to say, both tax and the legal contractual ramification should be borne in mind. Thank you, Prasanjit. The next question we have is an accounting question. Nitish, maybe you would like to take this. In the Indian context, is it possible to draw the completion accounts mid-month point other than end of the month? Yes, absolutely. The completion accounts can be drawn up at any point in time. It can be drawn up on the 10th of the month or the 20th of the month or the 15th of the month, etc. But uh, when you're looking at the closing accounts, it is very, very critical to look at, at a, with a very close lens that all, because when you draw it in the middle of the month or let's say 20th of the month and not at the end of the month, what tends to happen is that at, at times you tend to miss out all the provisions, et cetera, that is required and all the completeness is not insured. So therefore, if your closing is happening at the, in the middle of the month or as on a particular date of the month and not at the end of the month, make sure when you, get the closing accounts you look at it by the, with a very close lens that all the necessary estimates have been put in all the provisions have been made and ensure that all the completeness has been taken care of which your advisors would should be able to help you with but there is no regulation which states that it has to be the end of the month it can be any day that you decide provided the seller is able to come up with a set of accounts and their accounting with their accounting systems and able to produce that financial statements for you Thank you. Thank you, Nitish. Next question we have is generally understood that buyer has a withholding tax obligation while doing secondary transactions in India. Does purchase price adjustment impact the withholding tax obligation? Raj, would you like to take the tax question? 
Sure, sure, I can do that. Um, so the short answer to that is yes. If uh, more payment is required to be done, and that arises whether by virtue of a price adjustment or simply by account of a renegotiation of the contract price, I don't think it makes any difference. Uh, tax withholding obligation um, at a high level because there are two, three standard situations that we all uh, keep facing. Uh, as long as the seller is a non-resident uh, party selling shares, a tax withholding obligation would arise, whether the payment is the basic amount or on the adjusted price. Uh, if, on the other hand, the seller is a resident party, uh, then there is no tax withholding obligation requirement. On the other hand, if payments are being structured in the form of, let's say, salary, uh, like a bonus, which is like a part of coal at the end, or otherwise, in those cases, uh, the, uh, the uh, tax withholding obligation would continue to apply. Back to you, Antrich. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you so much. The next question we have is, what kind of contractual protections can be sought by a seller who's not involved in the business post-closing to ensure that the business hits agreed milestones? Prasenjit, would you like to take this one? Sure, sure. I think, again, you know, we have explained some of this earlier. I think the contractual protections are that, you know, you have this watertight metric sets in place, which really clearly defines uh, what these are and that's really you know the way to go uh, so so since we've already you know maybe we take some more questions because we have already covered this in the previous slides sure we can move to the next one this is a covid related question uh, given the current climate on account of uncertainties arising from covid can consistent judgment estimation techniques still be applied compared to the last drawn accounts Nitesh, would you like to take this accounting question Yeah, sure, Andruj. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, this is a very, very fair question. And I don't think uh, anyone really knows the extent to which, uh, uh, you know, uh, these things will get impacted. There will definitely be, if you have already signed uh, an earnout, right, and the earnout is going to, uh, let's say, fall due post COVID or let's say in June or July, obviously the matrices that you had thought through at that point in time will not be applicable, right? Because uh, let's take a few examples right there are inventories which are unsold there would be expired stock for retail businesses there'll be stock which will not be saleable the fashion changes there'll be so many things that will change and there will be a huge amount of one-off impacts that will come into play as far as the businesses are concerned right there's no sale of auto uh, the retail business is not uh, businesses are closed the entertainment and hospitality business has taken a severe beating the aviation sector has taken a severe beating so all of this will have an impact and it will be a one-time impact now <clears throat> obviously the business also would have gone down the question is that will an earnout structure in this case still hold good it's a tricky question i don't have an answer yes or a no to it because in such situation you will always have to go back to the negotiation table and figure out and negotiate with the other party it's not an outright say that okay you have not met your uh, uh, situation or you have not met your uh, uh, let's say target and therefore no amount can be given because the setup is going to come back to you and say that look uh, it was a black swan event or a force majeure situation right and some of those uh, some of those situations would be built in into your transaction documents and it's not a slam dunk case that okay even if you have not done it but we'll still pay you or not the buyer would not want to do that so obviously a lot of accounting estimates judgments etc will need to be taken care of you will have to take specific uh, specific you have to be worried about is all one-off impacts that will happen as a result of covid and the cash flow will become very very critical to analyze to see what cash flow impact this business uh, the businesses have had so i think those are the few uh, situation but you know there is no straight answer to this situation because it's a once in a lifetime event thanks thanks Nitish. i think we're running out of time but we can maybe take one last question this is, uh, do you have any practical tips spe specifically in light of the current lockdown owing to COVID-19 for the parties who have agreed for a post-completion adjustment? Prasenjit, would you like to take this one? Sure, Indra, sure. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question, actually, because uh, uh, what has happened is, you know, because of lockdown, uh, there are some practical challenges which have crept in, as like, for example, 
uh, when you have to arrange your data room, no longer physical diligence is possible. In inspection to the factories, the sites, that's no longer at least easily possible given the current lockdown. So what is happening is, you know, physical verification of books and accounts and records uh, naturally will not be that seamless. Not all companies keep their records in a digitized fashion. And as we still kind of uh, open up the lockdown, I think there will be a time lag. So one fundamental suggestion is when you today negotiate your contracts, please ensure that you keep some buffer in terms of this whole exercise of drawing up of accounts, uh, sending uh, the accounts back to the seller's accountant, this whole back and forth, it just keep some additional buffer in mind. Otherwise you will find in a, a unenviable position of having tripped the timelines and, and having to again basically get into a dispute situation. So that is you know, a certainly a key factor, which, which I will say one has to keep in mind in account of COVID-19. Uh, uh, that, you know, I would say that practical changes conceptually, of course, things remain the same. Try and do your diligences thoroughly as much as you can. If possible, avoid a substantial time lag between, uh, let's say, the last drawn accounts and the closing date. Try and draw up a pre-closing accounts. And if that is possible, then drop that account so that the swing of the adjustment is minimized. So for example, let's say the closing date is tentatively at 30th of June. Uh, what you do is drop a pre-closing account, management account by 1st of uh, May or 1st of June. And then by 15th of June, you close it out. So therefore, the only delta which needs to be dealt with post-closing is from 15th of June to 30th of June. And therefore, the scope of adjustment is substantially reduced. That is one thing you can do in these COVID times, minimize the gap of a post-closing uh, inspection, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, so these are the two fundamental tips, I would say, people who are trying to close a transaction right now or draft agreements, please keep these two factors in mind, uh, given the current unprecedented times we are living in. Thank you. Thank you, Prasanjit. I'm afraid we've ran out of time now. We have several other questions. We'll certainly try and address these offline. That concludes the Q&A session. We hope you found this webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. If you would like to know more about any of the topics discussed today, please feel free to reach out to our speakers here. We would like to receive your feedback on this webinar. We will put a short poll on your screen now. The poll will be available on your screen for about 30 seconds and you can select an option by clicking it on your screen. And as everyone responds to the poll, I'll inform you that when you close this webinar, a short survey will open in your browser. We'll be grateful if you fill that in too. The poll is now closed. Thank you for your feedback. Once again, thank you for being with us here today. We look forward to connecting again.